Hi everyone, welcome back. This is our fourth and final episode in our 2020 Emergency Response Guidebook series. Uh, and in the previous episodes, we've covered the yellow, the blue, the orange, and the green pages. In this episode, we're gonna cover uh, some things that are kind of peripheral uh, to those sections, uh, but are still extremely valuable information. And at the end, we're gonna do an overview for the smartphone app. We'll be right back. Bella's monitoring the weather closely. Here in North Carolina, we've got a nasty habit of ice instead of snow. Most folks agree that they'd rather have a foot of snow than a quarter of an inch of ice. It doesn't take much. Like Derek says, it'll bring your trees down. New Northern types, you say, man, that's nothing. We get that all the time. Here in North Carolina, this will make bread and milk fly off the shelf. So we're going to start here on page one, which is kind of our, our home page, if you will. Uh, and we'll just kind of move past this as, as we know the flowchart extensively from the previous episodes. Uh, on page two is a really good place that the book has provided for us. Uh, for, to write down some phone numbers uh, for some contacts that we may use quite often. So again, I'm just going to keep scrolling. If you would, just follow along with me in your book. And the book actually does have a table of contents uh, here on, on page three uh, that will break down all the different sections. And, and a lot of what we're going to talk about in this episode is, is on this table of contents. So outside the yellow, blue, orange, and green sections, uh, there's a lot of other information. So this is a way to, to find that information pretty quickly. Um, we've talked about here on page four, we've talked about in uh, specifically in the overview episode for this series, we talked about um, those safety precautions. Uh, and then on the next page, page five, some notification guidance. Uh, but these are really good for those of us uh, who may be out there who are not really comfortable with responding to hazardous materials incidents. A lot of ops level awareness and ops level responders are, are simply not very comfortable uh, with doing that because they don't do it very often. Uh, there's, they just don't have that muscle memory, that mental muscle memory. Uh, so page four and five are really, really good to kind of get us grounded, uh, to really get us safety minded, uh, to keep our crew and to keep the public safe. And then as we move into the flow chart, uh, it kind of gives us the guidance to move through the book efficiently. Here on page six, we have the hazard uh, classification uh, system. All nine hazard classes are listed here. Uh, and I'll scroll down just a little bit more here. You'll see uh, that the uh, nine hazard classes and their individual divisions, if, if they have divisions, are listed here as well. Uh, so this is a really good reference point. For, so when we see ha the hazard classes, either on a placard, a shipping paper, a label, whatever the case may be, this is a great place for us to go and to, and to reference that. I'm going to move just a little bit farther here uh, to our table of, of placards and labels. And even though we've, we've talked about these extensively in episode two, I want to make sure that everyone understands that there's additional information that's available. The publishers of this response guidebook, uh, who is in the United States, is PHMSA, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. They also publish a DOT chart. The most up-to-date DOT chart, and I'll put it here on the screen for your reference, and I'll also put it in the description, but the most up-to-date reference is DOT chart number 16. Um, that would be a great piece of reference material to have along with your emergency response guidebook right there in the rig, in the car, whatever your situation is. And, and what DOT chart 16 is giving us is some extra information about placards and labels and specifically for quantities. So there's a lot of rules with placards and, and it really boils down to the hazard, number one, but also for things that are, that are not as hazardous and they break it down for, to table one, table two, they're on chart 16, but for things that are not as hazardous uh, as, as some categories, uh, they're really, you're looking at, at weight. 
uh, is the deciding factor for our, our placarding rules. That's a general statement. There's a lot of other information. And again, DOT chart 16 is a great reference for that extra information out here on the scene. On page 16, the book talks about the globally harmonized system. And all of us have to have uh, training on the globally harmonized system. Uh, this is something that, that came into being over the last four to five years. This, is, this uh, episode is taped in uh, February of 2021. So just over the last few years, the globally harmonized system has come into being. Um, and, you know, a lot of folks had a lot of heartburn uh, over this because it was something different. It was something new. But the, the principles behind the globally harmonized system are things that we've been doing for years and years. Uh, so there's really not a whole lot of difference. And I'm going to boil it down to, to a couple of really simple, quick points. And I'll scroll to the bottom of the page here on, on 16. Uh, so you see your, your container. Um, and this, is, this could be a box in this particular example. Uh, could over here on the left hand side could be a box and there may be 30 40 of them on a pallet uh, you got another example of a drum here uh, so you'll have a dot and i'm circling it with my uh, with my cursor so you'll have a dot compliant label on the outside of that container but then on the container itself the inner package you'll see the the example here that they're showing for a globally harmonized system or ghs compliant label so scroll back up just a little bit and you'll see here that the, the bulleted items here are the items that are required for a globally harmonized system compliant label. Here's the thing with GHS labels. Just read them. Read the label. The information's there. There's no tricks. There's no trap doors. Um, there, there's really nothing more to do than simply read because they're, they're broken down and they're organized extremely well. We'll scroll down a little bit more here on page 17, and you'll see what they call the pictograms. Uh, the good thing about these pictograms, and these are internationally uh, recognized through the United Nations, internationally recognized pictograms. The neat thing for us uh, here in North America, and, and as, as well as uh, uh, Argentina in South America, but primarily the North American countries for, for the, the ERG, the cool thing is we were already using a lot of these pictograms in our placarding system. Uh, so there's not a lot of change here for us. There are a few that are a little bit different. It just takes some, uh, some getting used to. It takes some familiarity with the book. And it's as simple as that. So we don't really need to have a lot of heartburn over the globally harmonized system. Here on page 18 through 21, uh, we see uh, some extra information specifically for intermodal containers. Now, intermodal containers are those containers that can be taken from just, just what the, 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 the term says. They can be taken from one mode of transportation to the other. They can be taken from a ship to a train to a truck to back to a ship, whatever the case may be, um, without ever having to unload or manipulate the contents of that, that package uh, internal to that intermodal container. Uh, and that may be a, a, a tank style intermodal, it may be a, a container style intermodal that has commodity inside, it could be a number of different things. The thing to remember here, the important thing to remember is that this is simply extra information. Nothing changes. The four-digit ID number stays the same. But you see here in the middle of the page, and I'm circling it with my cursor, you see that there's a number on top of the four-digit ID number. And this number corresponds, and we'll, we'll just look at a, a, a few rolling down here on page uh, 19, and there's a couple of more pages that follow. Uh, but that particular code corresponds here, and I've got my cursor out beside it, corresponds to highly flammable liquid with a flash point below 23 degrees centigrade. Pure and simple. It's extra information. Where do these come from? Typically, you're seeing European countries and South American countries that will use this type of a placarding system or this extra information uh, along with the placarding system uh, and it, almost exclusively to the European and South American countries. Again, there's some extra reading here uh, in, the, in the preface to, to this section uh, if you want to do that. 
And then finally, uh, for the information that's up toward the front of the book, um, here on page 22 through 27, and I'm kind of parked here on page 23, there's some pipeline information. Now, pipelines crisscross this country uh, and, and the other countries that, that support the 2020 Emergency Response Guidebook. We have pipelines everywhere. Um, and a lot of times we don't really pay close attention uh, until there's an incident. Uh, the good thing about our pipeline system, uh, by and large, it's very well maintained and we have very few incidents. But when we do, it's important to understand. So I want to really kind of highlight the, the marking system here on page 23. Again, there's several pages uh, for some extra reading for you. Uh, but again, extra information out here on your scene to help you out. So join me if you would on page 354 uh, and you see here on the screen I've got right behind the, the green pages on 354 um, starts again a kind of a, a set of, of extra informational pages uh, right behind the green pages and, and on toward the, the back of the book. Uh, so you see here uh, on 354, starting on 354 through 359, is the, the 2020 Emergency Response Book User Guide. So everything that we've talked about in all four episodes uh, through the tutorial series here is based on this guidance here. So if, if it's been a while since you've, you've had your hands on the book um, and you've kind of lost that familiarity, these are some really good points. Um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't want that to happen out there on the scene. We want to remain familiar uh, with the book. But if, if you need that reference point, there's a, a good set of guidance here. Again, that's what these, these tutorials are based on. Here on page 360 and 361, uh, we've got some additional information for protective clothing. Now we talked about, again, in, in episode two, we talked about when we reviewed the orange pages, the orange guide pages, we talked about uh, the extra information for the protective clothing. So it's pretty generic, the information there in the orange pages regarding protective clothing. So if you, if you need to do some extra reading, if you want some extra information regarding protective clothing, you can come here to 360 and 361. Just keep in mind that chemical protective clothing for ops level responders requires specific training. Uh, so we want to make sure that we understand that. We want to make sure that if that's something that you're getting into with your agency, some specific extra training for chemical protective clothing is required. And structural firefighting gear offers very limited protection. Again, that's what this, this section is saying, but there's some additional information. Uh, also for respirators, uh, to, up to and, in, and including SCBA, when it comes to the hazmat world. Here on page 362, we've got some good guidance for decontamination. Um, and that's something that as an ops level responder, we, we can do without being in the product in, in most cases. Uh, so we can, can, we can decontaminate other responders. Uh, there may be technician level responders who have been in the hot zone. That's, that's we, as an operations level responder, that's a skill set uh, that we can possess to, to decontaminate those responders as well as provide decontamination to victims. Uh, again, we talked about uh, in the previous episodes, it's extremely important to remove contaminated clothing from any victim uh, of, of a hazardous materials incident who has been contaminated, but their, their body has been contaminated. Up to 90% of the contamination can be removed just by removing the contaminated clothing. So we wanna make sure that we understand that and make sure that we make that a priority for our incidents. So again, here uh, you see some, some good guidance and several pages here, 360, or excuse me, uh, one page here for decontamination on page 362. Again, we've talked about in the orange pages for fire control and spill and leak control. Uh, so we see here on page 363 and 364 that we have some additional information. Again, this is supplemental information from the orange pages. So starting on page 365, we have a chart that's specific to liquefied petroleum gas type of containers. Um, and these type of containers have the, the potential to fail violently uh, and, and experience what's called a blevy. A blevy stands for boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. Boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. And basically what happens is when these containers 
experience fire impingement. Um, and there's varying uh, levels of fire impingement that, that can create uh, this, this blevy situation. Uh, but the, the chart here, it's important to understand that the chart is based on and the studies are based on containers that are in good shape before the fire. In other words, they don't have a lot of corrosion, they don't have a, a lot of uh, you know, dings and, and, and dents and things like that. They're good containers from the, from the start. So when they have fire impingement, uh, these numbers are based on those good containers instead of bad containers that may fail much, much quicker. So we, we have to assume that that container may not have been in the best shape and assume that these numbers uh, may need to be taken kind of with a grain of salt. Uh, but again, just to understand these are approximate numbers. We may need to look at these numbers uh, with a little bit more safety precautions um, and increase our distances, uh, you know, increase our times, uh, and assume that these may fail much, much quicker uh, than what this chart is actually saying. It's a great chart. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the numbers, but again, we want to really understand that these numbers are approximate. You'll see here in the middle of the page that the primary hazards are obviously fire because we, we're talking about fire impingement uh, for the, the container uh, and then when they fail the all the contents of the container become immediately involved in fire so we have fire on the front end and then once they fail we have a, a, a much more serious exponentially larger and more intense fire uh, the other thing is, is our thermal radiation, uh, not only the fireball, but the thermal radiation that can go much, much farther distances than the fireball. Um, and then our blast pressure is a consideration that we want to look at, as well as projectiles. Remember, these containers are failing violently. Uh, so parts of the container uh, can be fragmented and it can travel great, great distances. And we'll see that when we look at the chart here. The other thing we want to talk about is a heat-induced tear. Now remember, we talk, talk about blevy situations, we're talking about liquefied petroleum gas. Those containers are under pressure. Now a non-pressure container can also experience a blevy type situation, but when we're not looking at a container that's under pressure to start with, uh, and we're looking at more of an atmospheric or a non-pressure container or a low-pressure container, we would look at that same situation as a heat-induced tear. Can there be pressure? Yes. With the, the, heat, the, the thermal impingement, the fire impingement on the tank, yes, there will be extra pressure over and above what the tank is normally seeing. Uh, so we, we may see a, a more of a violent, violent failure, uh, but these are, are, are not going to have the, the violent, catastrophic failure that a blevy will in most cases. Uh, so that we look at those more of a heat-induced tear. The container will still open up. It will still fail, and we will still see some of these, these issues that we talk, are talking about with blevies. But in this situation, we would, we would turn that as a heat-induced tear. So if you would just scroll with me to, to, the, to the next page, to the Blevy chart, uh, and I'm going to use my cursor. You see here over on the left side, we have the capacity of the container. So we can take, we can look at the container that we're dealing with, the, the container that's, that's involved, uh, and we can say, okay, what's the gallon capacity or the liter capacity, depending on where you are. Um, if we don't know that, and that may not be the easiest thing to find out, but if we don't know that, uh, then we have a diameter the tank diameter uh, and a length uh, of the container itself. So we'll look down here. When you start looking at 10 uh, foot diameter tanks, um, and this one, uh, what their example here is, 56 feet long. Uh, this is the large storage tanks that you see. Uh, we've got one just down the road here. It's actually a 70 foot tank. Um, by 10, 10 uh, foot in diameter, so uh, do, it doesn't actually doesn't doesn't even fit on this chart. So, uh, but you you can see here that you've got all kinds of, of tank sizes from very very small all the way up to those again those large storage tanks that you see at storage facilities, um, and then corresponding to that is the propane mass in pounds and in kilograms, corresponding again to all of those other tank sizes. 
So the next few columns that we see over here across the top are dealing with safety measures and safety factors that we want to think about when we look at what happens when these containers fail and how we need to treat things like evacuation and protective type measures. So you see the first column here is minimum time uh, to failure uh, for severe torch. Again, make sure that you understand that these are approximate times and that containers in, that are in not so good a shape um, can fail much, much quicker. And you see these, these times are pretty short. Uh, so with direct fire impingement, and when they, talk, when they say severe torch, they're talking about heavy fire impingement across the entire uh, surface of the tank. Um, and then they have a, a, a column here that talks about approximate time to empty for engulfing fire. Now this is talking about a tank with a, a, a functioning, properly functioning pressure relief device that's sized appropriately for the tank to withstand fire impingement. So we really, this is not the way we want to, to empty a tank uh, with, with under fire conditions. So again, take this one with a grain of salt. I don't really feel, my personal opinion, I don't really feel that this is of much use to us. I would much rather have some guidance here uh, about when I can expect the tank to fail uh, rather than how long it's going to take to empty it. Um, so again, just take that with some consideration. Here are the columns from fireball over. Here are the columns that if the tank doesn't fail, or excuse me, if the tank does fail, uh, what, we, what we need to be able to expect for distances. So the fireball radius, again, when the tank fails, the fireball radius for these sizes and, and, and the, the internal mass of the, the product itself, uh, it corresponds uh, to our fireball radius. So this is what it's saying in meters and feet, what we can expect for the actual fireball under failure conditions. So that you have the emergency response distance. Again, we talked about protected responders only belong in the hot zone uh, for any hazardous materials incident. And that means full protective clothing, whatever that may mean for that particular incident, typically structural firefighting gear and SCBA. Uh, so we wouldn't want to see any responder in that emergency response distance that wasn't appropriately protected. Again, appropriately protected could mean different things for different incidents. Uh, so make sure that you, you take that into consideration as well. You see the next column is the minimum evacuation distance and then you have a preferred evacuation distance. Uh, so basically what this is saying is understanding that there are places that are, are tough to evacuate. Uh, urban areas, uh, places where the terrain just it doesn't lend itself friendly uh, to evacuating and moving people very quickly. Remember, we're talking about very, very short amount of time to failure for these tanks. So the minimum evacuation distance is basically saying if we're going to evacuate, if we need to evacuate, this is the absolute minimum distance that we want to look at. And then the preferred would be if at all possible, if conditions allow, this, the preferred evacuation distance is just what it says. It's, it's, it is actually the preferred under any condition. Uh, the final column over here is the cooling water flow rate. Uh, so this is a recommended flow rate for cooling those containers. Remember, these containers can hold a lot of heat and they can fail, even after cooling, they can fail hours and hours and hours later. So we want to understand before we ever get started that it's going to take a lot of water to cool these tanks and there's potential that that cooling uh, may have to go on for hours and hours and hours after the fire impingement has even been taken away uh, because there's still potential for these containers to fail. Starting on page 368, you see some, some guidance for criminal and terrorist uh, events and activity uh, to include uh, chemical, biological, and radiological incidents. And we've, we've referenced a few of those as we've gone through the book, uh, but if you find yourself involved in one of these incidents, again, there's some really good guidance for you. And then on page 373, you see a chart here for improvised explosive device 
standoff distances. Uh, so this deals with, and, and make sure you look at page 374 because there's some additional, there's, there's actually a second page uh, to this chart. So uh, we'll just go through these columns and you see the examples that they have here. And again, on 374, some additional uh, specific to, to road uh, trailers uh, that you may see. But this, this page, and, and we'll kind of concentrate here, goes from everything from a pipe bomb up to a semi-trailer that, again, we're talking about used as a weapon here. The explosive capacity column here is talking about the capacity that the vessel, whatever the vessel may be, will, will, will be able to, to hold as far as, as explosive capacity. So a pipe bomb, uh, generally up to five pounds worth of material. A suicide bomber, generally speaking, a suicide bomber, if they have that on their body, about 20 pounds is, is what studies have shown. Uh, briefcase on up to, to uh, vehicles, uh, to up to include semi-trailers, and again, remember on 374. The next column here is mandatory evacuation distance, and this is talking about moving people away from that device, but there's a, there's a consideration here, and it's for a building. So the mandatory evacuation distance as well as the shelter-in-place distance or the shelter-in-place zone kind of go hand in hand. So make sure that you understand, and there's a footnote down here that talks about for, for that number two there uh, for the mandatory evacuation distance, is it's taken into consideration what an, an unreinforced building would be able to withstand based on this size and type of package. Uh, so again, the, the two columns here correspond with each other, the capacity, uh, the mandatory evacuation distance. But again, remember, it's, it's based on a building that's unreinforced, it's not designed to withstand the blast. And that's, that's where the distance consideration is taken. And then the next step to that, kind of taking it one more step is, if we're going to shelter people in place, if we're not going to remove them from the structure, but we're going to shelter them in place within the structure, then we need to be with beyond those distances. So that you see the shelter in place zone actually starts where the mandatory evacuation distance t uh, leaves off. So again, understanding uh, the, the consideration for unreinforced structure. The preferred evacuation distance, and again, with evacuation, we're talking about getting out of structures, getting completely away from the, the, the area here. Uh, you can see uh, that pipe bomb was starting at 1,200 feet. Again, this is outside distances, uh, and then accordingly down through the sizes. The glossary starts on page 375. This is a very comprehensive glossary. So as you go through the book, as you see things that are either in the, the yellow, blue, orange, and green pages, terms that you may not understand, chances are that term will be in the glossary. So make sure that you, you check the glossary out. Uh, there's a lot of extra information there just simply within the definitions of some of these, these terms that we may or may not understand. So now we're going to talk about the smartphone app for the 2020 Emergency Response Guidebook. I'll say this, I'm, I'm going to use the iOS platform because that's what I have, um, but I, I feel pretty confident that the Android platform or the Android version uh, is, is pretty, pretty close. Uh, so if you watch this one, you sh should be able to, to translate that over to Android pretty, pretty uh, clearly. Uh, so I'm, I'm screen mirroring to my um, laptop and I'm kind of new at that. so. <laughs> Work with me a little bit and, and, and bear with me as I, I navigate through, through that process. But I want to draw your attention down here to the bottom of the screen where it says about and it says about ERG 2020. I'm going to click on that and then right in the middle of the screen you'll see where it says the development was provided by the National Laboratory of Medicine. Uh, so that was a, a collaboration between PHMSA and the National Laboratory of Medicine. So when you go to your Apple Store or your Play Store uh, to look for this app, uh, this is the one that you're going to want to see. So you'll see out there that, that the National Laboratory of Medicine is the, the, uh, the provider for, for the app. Um, there are a number of others out there, um, and there may be others that you like better, the, like the way they look better, that kind of thing. Um, on the iOS side, this is the only one that I've found that does the mapping, and I really like the mapping, um, and that's the reason that we're, we're kind of reviewing uh, this app today. Uh, so just kind of want to give you that background. 
So we're back here on the home screen uh, and I'll click on what's new up at the top. Uh, these two items are just simply a little bit of an overview about the app. Uh, the ERG 2020 content updates here are the, the changes from the 2016 revision to the 2020 revision. You can also find those on the FEMSA website. There's a PDF there uh, that'll tell you what the changes are. Uh, there are a number of changes. Uh, most of them are things that, that we would never see. It's, it's things kind of in the background, uh, so not a big deal. We're going to go back to the home screen, and then we'll work down the page here. So I'm going to click on, in the search uh, section there, I'm going to click on search by name or UN number. Uh, so you can see here uh, that at the very top, you can enter either the four-digit ID number or the proper shipping name. You can see that I've been playing around with the app a little bit. So there's there's some recent materials that I've already uh, searched there. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of just play with those rather than uh, you wait on me to, to enter things in the search field up at the top. Uh, so let's look at 1219 first, that four digit ID number 1219 isopropyl alcohol uh, and guide 129 because that's the one that we followed through the book. Uh, and so let's, let's follow that one first uh, here in the app. Uh, before I click on that, up in the top right hand corner, um, you see the, the little icon that looks like a book. I'm going to click on that. Uh, you'll see, and, and as we spoke about previously in this episode, uh, the, the user's guide on page 354 in, in the book, um, you've got that option here too. So if you kind of lose your way, um, if, you, if you just kind of have brain fog about the, the, the book itself or the way that things are laid out, you can go back to the user's guide and it may help you stay on track. Uh, so again, back here uh, at our search page, let's look at 1219 isopropyl alcohol. So you'll see here that generally, and I'm going to scroll real slow, but generally it looks almost identical to what we see evacuation information there at the bottom on the, for the left hand side in the book. And then the right hand side of the book where you see right there for emergency response, that's the right hand side of the page in the book. So it's, it's identical to what we see in the, in the paperback copy. You'll see the reminder for the polymerization hazard. Pretty Again, it's, it's all here. Uh, so up at the top again, you'll see that book icon for uh, the user's guide. Again, a good reference for you. Uh, but I'm going to draw your attention as well up here to the map uh, button. So let's click on the map button. So you'll see that you have the opportunity to enter spill information so that we can overlay, and this is what I like the most about this particular app, we can overlay our spill, the initial isolation distance, that 360 degree uh, circle that we know kind of as the hot zone. Uh, and also we can overlay, at the same time, we can overlay that at downwind evacuation distance. Um, and then it, it looks at our square. Remember we said we need to go out half the distance on either side, so we end up with a square essentially for our evacuation. Um, and it shows us that square as well. So very, very, very neat um, feature here. So let's look at the spill location. I'll tap on that. Um, so I'm not going to use my current location uh, because I am actually at the, the home studio here. Uh, so I'm going to use, I live in Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm going to use a, a downtown location, uh, 100 North Green Street, uh, rather than my current location. So I'm just going to tap on 100 North Green. Again, I, for the sake of time, I've, I've kind of preloaded some, some information here. So uh, wind direction. Uh, there's two, two uh, selections here. You can use manual or you can use compass. I'm indoors right now, so I, I, the compass is not going to work for me. So I'm just going to put in, we typically have a predominant southwest wind uh, here in this part of the country, so I'm going to use that as my wind direction. So I can manually do that, or again, I can go to the compass, I can point it in the, in the direction of the wind based on the prompts that it gives me. It'll tell me exactly what to do uh, if, I, if I choose to use the compass uh, as to which way to point the, the phone. So once I set that, I'm going to back up, so I've got a southwest wind. Uh, I'm going to go to spill details, choose large or small spill. Again, our delineation, remember we talked about in, in episode three for the green pages, for this book, the difference in a large and a small spill for liquid materials is 55 US gallons for, for 
um, solid material is 660 pounds. So let's go ahead and say that it's a large spill because we want those extra considerations. We want to see, want to see that on the map. So for illustration purposes, I'm going to choose large. All right. So it is daytime right now. So let's let's say let's let's go with real time, and I'm going to say daytime uh, for for the the time of day, and then for the map type, I like to use the hybrid. So standard map is a, is a standard Google map. Uh, the satellite is again standard satellite ortho type map. The hybrid actually will put in some some <clears throat> some points of interest and things like that. So not only do I have my street names, I've got my building plots, but I've also got uh, some points of interest and things like that. So if you're telling people where to, to evacuate, if you're instructing crews on where to evacuate, points of interest and, and those kinds of things may help you out. So I kind of like the hybrid map, so let's choose that. And the default color uh, overlay is an orange, an opaque orange, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. You can change that color overlay um, if you'd like. So down at the bottom here, you see the, the book icon again for, for that ERG user's guide. I can go back to my home screen, uh, and then I've got a plot. So you see the little, the little crosshair looking uh, icon there is a plot. I've also got a plot button up in the top. So remember that crosshair icon in the bottom. If I go to my map, and then I need to come back to this screen, I'll use that little crosshair icon in the bottom. Otherwise, I'll just click plot up in the right, upper right hand corner, and you'll see here that it plots it on my map. So I'm gonna scroll, or excuse me, zoom in just a little bit. I'm gonna zoom in first right here to, to the circle. So you can see the circle uh, within the, the cone and the square, but the circle represents that uh, initial isolation distance. So remember, we're talking about isopropyl alcohol, UN number 1219, we know that it's a liquid, so you see there that it's telling us 150 feet initial isolation distance. That's right in keeping with the, the ERG and the information that we've already learned. I'll scroll back out just a little bit, and you see that it, it actually cuts off my downwind distance. If you turn your screen and you where it'll widen your screen out, I'm not going to do that because on my screen mirror it will actually cut my, my video off so I'm not going to do that but the, the key to for that not to happen is go down to the bottom and click on that that crosshair icon that's dead center of the bottom and just redo all your parameters there and turn your screen to the side if you want it out wide turn your screen to the side before you hit plot and then when you hit it you'll see the downwind evacuation distance will be there the reason it's cutting it off is quite simply the screen's just not wide enough so uh, nothing nothing wrong with the with the um, with the program, uh, everything's, everything's fine. It's just cutting it off simply because of screen uh, size. All right, so I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit and you, you zoom just like you do on any other um, you know, Google Map style um, map. And you'll see here that you have the cone for our downwind evacuation distance. Remember the, evac the, the cone is, a, is allowing for and compensating for wind variations. So a, a, a basically speaking a southwest wind, but we've got those variations, so that's what the cone's all about. And then our square there, you see for half the distance either side of the center line of the wind direction, half the distance of the downwind evacuation on each side so that we end up with essentially a square uh, for our evacuation distance. All right, so you see down at the bottom, we go back, you see down at the bottom, uh, the little icon is the second from the right. Um, it lo almost looks like a, a copy icon uh, for, for a copy paste. Uh, it kind of looks like that. If you click on it, it gives you the option to show the spill, to show your location, and to show your location in relation to the spill. If you're not right there directly on top of what's going on, kind of like I am now. Uh, so the, the address is actually downtown. I live several miles from downtown. Uh, so I could click on show me, show the spill, and then show my relationship to the spill if I'm not actually there. Chances are we're gonna be on scene, so this may not be terribly useful to you. Uh, again, I'll show you the, right, the little crosshair um, icon. I'm gonna show you when you click on that, Again, it just sends us right back to, to look at our parameters for the mapping feature, okay? So let's go back to our 
search screen. So we're, we're backing up a couple of clicks. So we're going to go back to the search screen. And I want to just point out here, we're not going to click on Pentol, uh, but I just want to point out here that the th this is a material that has the polymerization hazard. Uh, so you'll see there the Guide 153P. Um, so again, the, the app does a great job in doing exactly what the book does for us and pointing out those hazards. All right, so let's look at the... Um, the, the green highlighted material. So you'll see 1017 here for chlorine. So I'm going to click on that. Then I'm, again, takes us to our, um, to our guide page. So down at the bottom, let's look first at the protective distance. Okay. So the reason I clicked on chlorine is because chlorine is one of the six most commonly transported TIH, PIH materials, toxic inhalation, poison inhalation, hazard materials. So that means that we're also going to see chlorine not only in table one in the green pages, but we're going to see it in table three in the green pages as well. So you'll see up at the top of the screen here, that's, that's our table one for the hard copy. That's our table one information for chlorine. So you don't see the large spill because in the book, if you go to the book and you go to chlorine in the large spill column, it's going to tell you to refer to table three because it is one of those top six. So you see the small spill information there and you scroll on down and this is where you'll see your table three information for chlorine. All right, so let's go back up to the top. And, and again, well, before we leave the bottom, if I want to go back to the guide page, I can go over there, click on the guide page, click back and forth to my green pages for chlorine uh, there, down there at the bottom for those two icons. All right, so let's click on the map. And there's a, a few different things. It's going to default to, to the location that I had, a 100 North Green. So we'll just keep that uh, wind direction. We're going we'll to need to put that back in. So I'll do just like I did before. Spill details. So now you see that there's some differences when we choose large spill that there, it's going to give us those table three parameters for the, the specific container type uh, that we're dealing with. All right, so also the, the table three information for the wind variations is going to be down here as well. So you see that as you scroll a little bit to the bottom. All right, so we've got that. Um, and then we're going to say, let's, let's change it this, again, do it in real time. Say that it's daytime. I'm going to change to my hybrid map again. I'll keep the same, uh, dis same uh color on there. There's no need to change that. I'm not going to scroll in, but you see the initial isolation distance of 3,000 feet. Again, that's green page numbers because it's reaching out and getting that, that green page information because of this material being toxic inhalation hazard. Um, and it's, it's a, a, a huge distance and you can go back and look at table three and see what that distance would be. I'm not going to, to zoom in on that because we've, we've already done that. Okay. So again, wanted to look at chlorine because it grabs the table one and the table three information. All right. So we'll look at one that doesn't do that again for chloroacetone stabilized. It's, it's only a table one material. So it doesn't go to table three. So you can see there that you have the large and the small and that's pretty much it. It doesn't, doesn't grab any table three materials. Same thing with the map goes to the same place, does the same thing. All right, so we'll go back to the home page and we'll search by image. So let's click on search by image. And this is putting us on the, the table of placards from the hard copy. Uh, and you can see up at the top, we can search by placard or we can search by rail car or road trailer silhouettes. Uh, so this is, again, this is right behind the flow chart in the, in the hard copy of the book. Um, so we'll look at placards and you can click on the placard or you can click on, and we'll go down to 1219, that, that placard that, that would be appropriate so that we kind of stay along with what we did in the book uh, and then what we've done earlier in this section. Uh, so you see flammable liquids, Class three, this is the one we're supposed to be on right there. So let's get all, let's get that ammonia out of the, the, the screen there. So I can click on the placard 
or I can click on guide 127 and it'll take me over to that. All right. Now, what I want to point out here is there's an obvious omission of the map button. Remember, if we're looking at by, by just a visual on a placard, or let's look over here at rail cars, and you'll see that if I click on any rail car, same thing happens. We don't have the map button. The reason for that is, remember these guides and these placards and silhouettes of the, the cars and the trailers and that kind of thing, they're looking at groups of materials. The map feature will only plot if we're looking at a single material because it, it can't take into account all the different variations for those groups. So that's why we don't see the map button here if we're looking by placard style, placard visual, or by, by rail car and, and road trailer. Okay? So by image, rail cars, and then let me make sure we get over here to road trailers again. Exact same thing that we're seeing in the hard copy. Okay, if we know our guide page, and I'm back on the home screen here, if we know our guide page, uh, we can browse by guide pages. Now, generally, again, this is where familiarity with the book is really important. Uh, where I can see this would be the most valuable is if I need to go to guide 111 because I have very little information. No four-digit ID number, no uh, proper shipping name, I can't see the container, don't see a placard, anything like that, but I know I've got a problem of some kind, um, and I know I need to go to guide 11 because I, I, I'm familiar with the book, so I could browse the guide pages and I could go straight to guide 111 and get my good information. Okay, so again, we can browse by guide page, again, from, from the home screen. The reference material, we'll click on that from the home screen, as we talked about in the first part of, of this episode, there's a number of other pages, and I listed those for you in the first part of this episode, but you'll see here as we go through, and we'll just click each one of these, uh, that the app does a really good job of compiling all of those pages. Uh, so you'll see the example of the shipping papers, just like it's on the inside cover of the book, and I'm not gonna click all of these, but safety precaution from page four in the book, uh, there's a number of other things, how to use the, the orange pages, uh, the user's guide that we've talked about a number of times. That's in the back of the book. Uh, the glossary's in the back of the book. So the app does a really good job of, of grouping those. Hazard classification, again, the nine hazard classes that we just talked about at the early part of, of this episode. Rail car trailers, all, all those pages that are in the book that are not in the blue, yellow, orange and green, the app does a really good job of compiling those. So make sure that we, we consult those pages just like we would if we were talking about the, the, the hard copy of the book so that we don't miss anything. The reference material is, is here for you uh, just like it is in the book. Again, I, I really like the app. I like this one because of the mapping feature. I think that's extremely valuable. Uh, that gets us some good solid information very, very quickly to get folks out in the field performing evacuation and getting that done. Again, I'll remind you, make sure that you stay familiar with the book. Make sure that you keep the book handy because the, the batteries won't go dead in the book. Uh, the signal will never fail you in the book. Um, you know, having it in your hand, there's nothing that, that will replace that. And, and sometimes I think we can get too reliant on technology and, and the, wire, the whole wireless thing and, and all that. So, but again, a, a really good app. I like it. I highly recommend it. Uh, and thank you for being with us on this episode. I'll remind you to, uh, to subscribe. If you're not already subscribed, um, this is a series. This particular episode is the last uh, in a series on the emergency response guidebook. So if you haven't seen those other episodes, make sure you go back and look at those. It kind of brings this all together. Uh, as a package deal. But again, remember to subscribe to the page, click that notification so you'll, you'll get alerted when we, we post new content. Um, if you like what we're doing, put it down in the comments. Uh, if you wanna see other stuff, um, if, you, if you're out here and you're seeing it, uh, things out here on the road in fixed facilities, whatever incidents you're responding to when it deals with hazardous materials and you want some more information, you're, 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 uh, you need some, some, some guidance, 
put it down in the comments for us and we'll, we'll do that research for you. Uh, we're here for you. This is your, um, this is your channel uh, and we want to be a resource for you. Let us know. My email's in the, in the description as well. If you go to our channel, you, you can see my email. Feel free to email me as well. Thank you for being with us and we'll see you next time.